Welcome into Fantasy Film Ball, the show where we turn movies into sports and sports into something that we don't talk about. And today, we're going to be discussing The Fablemans, Steven Spielberg's brand new film. As always, my name is Matt. I'm here with Dylan, and we're going to be discussing some Spielberg goodness. Um, so, Dylan, what did you think about The Fablemans? I've seen it for months now. I saw it back at TIFF, twice at TIFF, but you finally just seen it. Overall, how are you feeling? Does this live up to the Spielberg legacy? And does this live up to being the current best picture front runner? So first off, we got, wrong way, we got Jaws right here, one of Spielberg's best <laughs> movies. Uh, so, you know, I do love me some Spielberg. And I have to say, I kind of feel like this movie, how everyone felt on their first view, where it's like, it's good. It's a great I'm not sure, but I really want to watch it again. And I think that speaks Mm -hmm. a lot to this movie. It's one that you want to be invested in, you want to like, you want to love. And there's things I really do like about it, but there's also some things I really am kind of on the fence about that I think a repeat viewing would really help. Um, I plan to go see it next week, so that will be a very... I think that bodes well for just this film in general. If you're out there thinking about, should I go watch The Fablemans? I want to go watch it a second time, and I wasn't as high on it my first viewing. Matt's seen it twice, and he liked it both times. Um, This is a movie that's out there that I think a lot of people should see. Just the question is, how can they see it? Because uh, Universal is uh, really not knowing how to market their Oscar movies this year. This and She Said have had horrible release strategies, but they're both Mm -hmm. movies that really demand to be seen because they're two really good films. Yeah, I I agree with you on this. And... As for having to see it multiple times, I don't think you need to. I just think that there's something to be said for coming into a film with astronomical expectations. Basically, any time I go into something being told, this is the best thing ever, this is the best thing ever, or expecting this is the best thing ever, um, I pretty much always have to watch it a second time free of expectations, knowing what it is, knowing how I feel about it, to really get a clear idea of something. And when I saw The Fablemans for the first time at TIFF, I went into it thinking, oh my god, I'm seeing Steven Spielberg directing his own biopic. This is going to be the greatest thing of all time. I get to be in the same room as Spielberg. And coming off of that wave of hype, I couldn't help but feel a little disappointed, even though I really liked the film. And it took me another watch, knowing exactly what it was, to really fall in love with it. And this is sort of the thing about it. It's not a dense film. It's not a film that you need to pick up on details to watch again. It's just more a film that you need to know what to expect. Not even need to know. I think it's just good to know what to expect and not to expect maybe too much from it, I'd say. Uh, because it's a really sweet film, but um, yeah, is it is it uh, Spielberg's best? I wouldn't say so. I think it's a really charming, charming and very sweet movie, though. Um, but we'll get to the topic of Oscar chances a little bit later. Personally, as much as I love this, I don't really see this being something that I would look back at in 20 years and say, yeah, that was best picture worthy. Uh, but what do you, do you feel? I mean, at this point, I think you need to see it again before you can kind of come to a conclusion there. But how would you feel? Think forward to the future. In 20 years, would this be a film that you'd look back at and go, good best picture winner? Or would you look back at it more as like a confusing choice? I think it would be a confusing choice if you didn't know what it was. Because I think a lot of the goodwill for this movie comes because it is the Spielberg biopic, per se. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a man that we all have grown to love, whether it's him himself or his films over the years, and became so attached to it. So it has this built-up pedigree before you even go into it. This was really not the movie I was expecting, to Matt's point that he made earlier. I don't really know what I was expecting, but this movie was not it, per se. Uh, I did enjoy the movie, as I said before, but the contents of the film. It's also a two and a half hour film. Does not need to be that long. Um, that's its biggest. That's my biggest gripe with the movie uh, yeah. is its length. There's a lot. I don't know per se what I would cut off the top of my head, but I know there's like okay, we have a little too much of this plot detail here, this storyline here. Trim it up a little bit. Um, there's some things that I think really work, which we'll get into here in a little bit, and some things that I wasn't as high on. But in terms of a best picture win, yeah, this would not be my pick. I don't know if it's in my top ten at the moment for the year, but 
Uh, it's one I fully understand why people are getting behind because it's Spielberg because it's. I know this word gets overused all the time, but it is a, it is an ode to cinema, a love letter per se. And yeah. I, I fully get why people are clamoring, why they're shouting that this deserves the award. Do I think it will get there at the end of the day? No, I think it's going to run at steam and die out. But there is a question I know a lot of people have been arguing for months ever since Universal made its decision. Not just because they're a little bit boneheaded when it comes to release strategies. They also don't know how to put people into categories. We saw this with Nope, with uh, Kiki Palmer being in supporting. We saw this with Carrie Mulligan and She Said being moved to supporting. But Michelle Williams went from supporting to lead. And I know I'm on the different side of that. I think she is a co-lead in this movie, but I know I am like the only person in the world who does think that. You're not the only person in the world, but you're certainly in the min- uh, the minority on this one because she's just she's not she's not a lead in this film. She's not a lead. She's very much a supporting. She is an important part of of Sammy's story, but she's always in the sideline of Sammy's story. It's always Sammy's story. She is always an accessory to the story, a part of his growth. But I don't think it's ever at any point, it's never Mitzi's story. And when I think about is someone lead or supporting, I think about two things. And it's, is it their story? And are they the focal point? Mm -hmm. And again, she's never the focal point of really any scene. Um, It's always, everything is always seen as this is Sammy, this is Sammy, this is Sammy, and she's also there. I don't know. She she feels like a textbook. She kind of straddles the line between lead and supporting, I would say, but she's much more supporting in my mind because she, that's what she does. She she's supporting. Um, she's supporting Sammy's story in every scene. She's supporting him. Um, yeah, that's that's my argument. I don't know. I think I've I've said enough about <laughs> her being supporting. I want to hear your argument for why you feel that she's lead because it seems so clear cut to me. At least to me, the big thing that leaps off the page is the screen time. I think of any actor in this film, she is physically on screen the longest. Do I have numbers to back that up? I do not at this moment. But at least from one watch, she felt like the face I saw the most throughout the film. And as for the story, yes, this is the story of Sammy Fableman. But multiple times throughout the film, they they emphasize a lot how Sammy is the way he is because of his mother. Him and his mother connect in so many different ways, whether it is art, whether it is personality, whether it is their ability to dream and create. And while Sammy, yes, is the focal point and the story does come through him, his story is weave and guided due to his mother's decisions without getting into any sort of spoilers or anything like that. Sammy gets from point A to point B because of Mitzi, not because of himself. Throughout the most of the movie, near the end, it does become Sammy full lead sort of thing. But I think there is a case for Williams instead of it being so uh, one note where it is supporting. But I know I was on the opposite side too with the whole decision with Carrie Mulligan. I thought Mulligan does make sense for supporting why a lot of people think Mulligan's a lead and I'm the opposite here for Williams. But moving away from lead to supporting category fraud, we have a lot of supporting actors Mm -hmm. clamoring for an Oscar nomination. And my first question for you is, uh, between Seth Rogen, Paul Dano, and Judd Hirsch, which one was your favorite? Uh, Awards aside. Yeah, I mean, my my favorite, I think I mentioned this before on the show, Uh, my favorite is by far Seth Rogen. I think that he's so warm, so easy to love it's very uh very easy to see why the events of this film go the way that they do in regards to his character because he's so kind and giving and um just a very warm person in comparison with some of the other characters some of the other men in the story who are much more cold and uh less supportive than he is uh, so I, I really love what he's doing. I think he's he's bringing the goods. He's doing his Seth Rogen thing, but he's doing it in a way that really, he's acting his ass off in this. He does a great job, and it's so easy to fall in love with him. Um, but Judd Hirsch, I think, is also really great. He steals the show in his one scene. But I, I know I've I've said all my thoughts on this in, in previous episodes. So what about you? What's your take on the three supporting men in the story? I think I kind of lie with your thoughts that you said in other episodes. Paul Dano, to me, kind of just seems like he's trying to do, like, a stagey type performance, uh, for lack of words, where he's, like, very much 
enunciating some words. Maybe that's how Spielberg's actual father spoke. I don't know much yeah. about Spielberg's actual family. So uh, maybe some of my faults with this movie, because another one is I think Michelle Williams is very much overacting in a lot of scenes. But maybe that's how Mitzi was in real life. She was very much a character and very much a very emphasizer sort of thing. And I think Paul yeah. is the opposite, where he's very subdued and doesn't really have a personality and he's kind of just there to push and pull and sort of thing but i do agree Mm -hmm. i think seth rogan delivers what may be my favorite performance from him uh in his career Uh, it's definitely at least in the top three he's very good here i would love i know i mentioned before about starting cutting stuff a lot of people probably say oh you cut some of seth rogan scenes i would want more seth rogan scenes um and yes judd hirsch is amazing if someone did get the oscar push for this movie i would want it to be judd hirsch um just the biggest thing against him is what everyone has said he's in one scene and can you really get nominated for one scene that's what we'll find out here shortly but um i mentioned this a little bit earlier and i want to bring it back up now because i think this is a really big thing with the fablements if this was not a movie about Steven Spielberg, directed by Steven Spielberg, would you still care? Would you care if this was just a original story about a young boy learning to fall in love with cinema and become a filmmaker? I mean, I would. I, I think that uh, it does enough to make you feel for this character, even without knowing who he becomes in the mm-hmm. end. But that said, I mean, outside of being just a, a very solid coming-of-age movie... I don't really think it does give much of a reason to care about the story outside of knowing that Steven Spielberg becomes Steven Spielberg. And we're seeing that in the box office, right? In the box office, this film is absolutely tanking. It's flopping so hard. It's not being seen. And the reason that it's not being seen is not just because it hasn't been marketed at all. It's because people, general film goers, don't care about who Spielberg is. They don't. You know, and, and, you know, even if they do, they extra don't care about the fact that the film is not called The Spielbergs. You know, that might have more of a draw. This is a fictional family based on Spielberg. No one knows what the film is about. Uh, Spielberg's pretending it's not about him when it very much is. And I think that is, uh, people don't care, evidently. They don't care. Uh, about the film, whether or not it is about Spielberg. And I think that kind of shows a little bit of where that lies, uh, that this film is as big as it is within the film community because it's about Spielberg. But outside of that, people who don't care about Spielberg, they're not really finding a reason to go see it or to connect with it, evidently. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned general audiences, they don't care. But you know who does care about Spielberg? The Oscars. So what chances does the Fablements have? Because at the moment, most pundits would lead you to believe this is winning Best Picture. Matt's made his case why he does not believe the Fablements has a chance at all. And I'm also on that ship. I don't think the Fablements will win because what can it really win? Yeah, you can make the case for director. uh, But outside director, like we saw last year with Jane Campion, uh, Power of the Dog won nothing. And this year, the Fablements seems in the same boat because Michelle Williams... She doesn't seem like she's a win actress. You got Kate Blanchett no. and Tar, Daniel Deadweiler, until even Michelle Yeoh and everything ever all at once. Then you move into some other categories like supporting actor. Kiwi Kwan for everything everywhere seems to have that in the bag. Uh, you move to uh, some other technical categories like editing or cinematography or sound. Those are all categories where you think, oh, it's Avatar or it's Top Gun Maverick. It's not the Fablemans. And then what does that really leave it with? Maybe a score? But uh, as we've mentioned on the show before, this score is pretty much not original, and the original parts are not what you notice throughout the whole movie. So no. what can the Fablemans win outside of director if it's not winning picture? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you feel the same way about the score as I do, because this is something, actually, someone on Reddit called me out for this recently, being like, oh, I see you gave the film a five stars on on letterbox but you trash talk it all the time on here and i was just like man i just talk about how the score is is being vastly overestimated because it's john williams the score doesn't exist like literally you see what i mean right the Mm -hmm. the scene with the you know as mitzi is playing the piano and he's watching the projector the song is going the like that is the song that you think of when you hear oh yeah, the music of this movie, you think of that song and that is a classical piece. It's pre-written, pre-existing. It is, you know, and it's the pivotal moment of the film. 
Um, but yeah, I, I'll trash talk the score as much as, as I want because yeah, this is, this is nothing. And, um, yeah, so it's not winning score. I've heard a lot of people say it could win cinematography. I don't necessarily agree with that because there are so many other strong contenders and the film doesn't look very flashy. It doesn't feel like what that branch goes for anymore. It'll probably get nominated, but it won't win. I don't think it can win production design. I don't think it can win costumes. I don't think it can win editing. Um, I don't think it can win cinematography up against the competition, which is everything everywhere all at once. And Banshees, one of those two is screenplay, winning. You mean. This is number three there. Oh, in screenplay. What did I say? Cinematography. Oh my god, yeah. So I already said so cinematography it can't win. It also can't win screenplay. I'm evidently quite tired right now. Um but yeah, I I Spielberg wins. Probably. But what else is it winning? And I, I come to the same conclusion as you there. I, I don't see it winning a single other award. Maybe Judd Hirsch climbs up and it gets that golden package of director, supporting actor, picture. But that doesn't look likely right now. Maybe we'll start to see more of a path for that later, but I don't see it at the moment. I I think that is a chance as well. But the thing with Judd Hirsch is even though like you and I are praising him here and some people online are doing that as well, at the end of the day, everyone keeps saying he's in one scene. And Paul Dano's yeah. in the movie too, and Paul Dano's overdue, so should we nominate him? And there's even a crowd out there that says Seth Rogen's giving his best performance. Let's throw him a bone. And no one's clamoring yeah. to Judd Hirsch like they are doing with other people. Even putting away Quan with everything everywhere. There's people with Gleason saying Gleason should win. Or there's people saying a little bit of a smaller performance, like a Brian Tyree Henry should be in the conversation. I don't hear people saying Hirsch deserves to win or Dano deserves to win or Rogan deserves to win. They're just saying they should be nominated. Yeah. Um, but yes. Yeah, I haven't heard anyone say Rogan should be nominated as much as I personally think he should. I don't think Rogan's really in the conversation. It seems like Hirsch and Dano are the ones in the conversation. Um, and yeah, I, I'm hearing a lot of people saying Hirsch should be nominated, but no, I haven't heard anyone make a case for why Hirsch deserves the win here. I, no one has made that argument to me. Well, do you have any last thoughts about the Fablemans here today? Um, I love this film. As much as it sounds like I'm trash-talking it at times, I think I'm just trying to think ahead and be a little bit realistic in terms of its Oscar chances. I do think this is a great film. I love it. It's one that I know I'm going to revisit a lot. It's one that made me laugh, made me smile. I think it's, um, like, if I could mention one other scene, is just, like, I, I love the meta-commentary that this film um, constantly brings in where you can feel Spielberg writing uh, from his own perspective, knowing what he knows now and putting that onto himself as a teenager. I think it's so beautiful, so brilliant. There's a few lines in there, like when he's uh, he's fighting his bully and he makes a little joke about, you know, like, oh, well, I'll never tell anyone unless I make a movie about it. It's just so, so goddamn genius and so fun. And yeah, I just want to leave this on. I don't dislike this movie. I absolutely love it. And uh, I will probably sound like I'm trash talking it on this show quite a bit. Uh, but it's a great film. I fully agree. Great film. My favorite part of the movie was the sequences that Sammy shoots. Um, I really wish if they still had the footage, like from when Spielberg was actually a kid, it could have been like spliced in somehow. But I really like the showcasing of like we get to see what Sammy shoots because there's so yeah. many times in movies or TV shows there's a creator and he creates or she creates something, but we never see what they actually create. And we actually get to see it here. And I think that was just such a nice inclusion. But this is um, actually a funny thing. Sorry, I'll, I'll just say one last thing before we wrap up this, which is uh, Spielberg in his talk, he said that he tried to recreate his movies shot for shot. Lovely. And he used this as an opportunity. He went back to his movies, storyboarded them based on the films, um, and he uses an opportunity to make the films better than they were before. So these are not the versions. He's like, I'm making it look like I was much better at this than I was. My films were shit. They were awful. Um, so I'm just using this as a way to redo them and remake them a little bit better than I did when I was a kid, which is very sweet. So this is not how his films looked. Uh, but, you know, he, he used this opportunity to remake them, which I think is so lovely and so sweet. Well, for everyone out there who has seen The Fable Men's, let us know below what was your favorite aspect of this. Did you love Michelle Williams? Do you think Judd Hirsch or Paul Dano or Seth Rogen is just the best supporting actor in this film? But that's Matt. My name's Dylan. This is Fantasy Film Ball, and get the fuck off my video.